Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and welcome to this episode of Sharia Intelligence where we are looking at the maqasid of Sharia, the higher intent, the objectives, the goals, the wisdom, the purposes behind the Quran and the Sunnah. I am your host Muhammad Nuruddin Lemu and with me to discuss today's topics are two of our distinguished facilitators in this course. Sister Salatu Suleh and Brother Nasir Beldo, you are both most welcome. Assalamu alaikum. Alaikum as wa rahmatullah. Thank you. Um, last time we discussed uh, what this subject was all about, and I'd like us to move forward on this subject area. Starting with Malam Nasir, we find in a lot of literature that has come out over the last decade or so, more and more writings on the subject of Maqasid Sharia. We find more talks going on within the Muslim community on the subject of Maqasid Sharia, more Islamic organizations uh, dealing with this in conferences and seminars. Um, why is it becoming more important within the Muslim community uh, as a tool in the quality control of fatwas in contemporary society? I think uh, the reason why this is happening uh, has so much to do with the nature of world we live in. We live in a world that is really globalized, um, a world where things are uh, happening very fast. Rapid things are rapidly changing. Uh, we are experiencing advances in almost every field uh, you can think of. Um, a world that is characterized by the acronym BUKA, uh, that is volatility, the world is highly volatile, uh, is uncertain, uh, and that speaks to uh, how you cannot predict what happens tomorrow um, because of the speed within which things change in the world. Um, a world that is characterized by complexity and ambiguity and how things are so diverse. Um, and therefore, in this kind of world, you find uh, things becoming quite irrelevant. Uh, in a very short time and most of the non-secondary tools uh, uh, that we use in, in Usul, you find that uh, um, uh, as much as they were very relevant and helpful in the past, uh, the role they play and the way they fit into our reality is actually diminishing uh, uh, rapidly. Uh, if you look at how this works and how they influence the nature of fatwa production and that actually allows or give opportunity for the tool of maqasid in particular to take the lead in the crafting of the new fatwas that will fit in our changing reality. You will see few and few uh, 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 tools of usul that we've known uh, manifesting or playing any role in the emerging fatwas or contemporary fatwas on many issues. If we take, for example, Qiyas, um, particularly from the angle of doing Qiyas on the basis of Illa, not Hikmah, you find a lot of you know limitation and the relevance is quite uh, diminishing. And so um, also, if you look at tools like Ra'i Sahabi, uh, the opinions of the companion, ordinarily you can understand why uh, this, uh, because of the gap in time and the space and the and the, and the way the world is changing so much so that probably uh, some people who live even in the last 100 years or 200 years cannot imagine or make sense of the kind of world we live in. And therefore, uh, naturally, you would find the opinion of uh, companions, particularly on generally where you usually find their opinions on issues to do with uh, mundane worldly affairs becoming very, very much irrelevant. Um, again, if you look at... Uh, Tools like Ijma and Amal also are experiencing the same thing, um, becoming quite irrelevant uh, with the contemporary fatwas that I imagine, fatwas that I imagine. Um, some of the other tools that you would find playing quite a very, very insignificant role are tools like Sharu Man Qablana, where you find it featuring in uh, very, very small areas of Islamic finance, uh, issues around environmental conservation and development, issues around uh, very few corners you find scholars actually mention issues around politics. For example, you will find some 
uh, uh, references being made to these particular things. And therefore, um, in a world that is changing, where the past is becoming quite alien to what obtains in the contemporary time, um, scholars have understood that Maqasid being sort of a compass or a direction uh, is probably uh, one of the only tools that can be relied upon for guide uh, to Muslims, particularly uh, uh, in coming up with fatwas that are, are fitting to the realities that we live in and are faithful to the spirit uh, of Sharia. This is, um, this is very, very interesting. The point you're making of the gap and the widening gap, the speed of the gap between the present and the past, between the environment, especially on areas to do with Mu'amalat, as you said, where scholars gave opinions in contexts to do with politics and economics and history and geography that have rapidly changed uh, with the world we, you know, compared to the world we currently live in. And as you've mentioned, certain tools of usul like ijma, um, like qiyas using the illa, sharu man qablana, ra'i sahaba, some of these not really appearing in most contemporary uh, fatwas that fatwa councils are coming up with. Um, so, Sister Salah, what could you add to this? So we'd have a rapidly changing society. Um, so what's going on? Why, why we've understood certain tools are becoming less relevant to contemporary reality. Some may still be relevant, but just less relevant. Um, how do we see changes from your perspective? Okay, I would like to talk about the tools of usul al fiqh and their um, continued relevance. Brother Nasser has mentioned some of those that are showing up less on the table when it comes to the decisions made in contemporary times by fatwa councils and the muftis. Then there are those that still bear a great deal of um, relevance that many fatwa councils find very, very useful given the times we live in. And those tools happen to be the ones that are makosid oriented or as um, you would sometimes call them Makassidic tools, such as the Istidlal tools, that's Istihsan, juristic preference, where the jurist is actually looking at the situation and seeking the tool that would best bring, the, bring benefit to um, people generally. Or um, the other one, which is Maslaha, looking at what is the benefit to be derived from this. And then um, Swat Adariya, taking a position that blocks the means to um, harm or haram by making something that is otherwise permissible, um, not permissible. Other tools that remain relevant that we find, um, such as um, is this hub, the presumption of continuity, or of the custom of people, are also Makosid oriented in nature. So these tools remain um, useful and even one would say in comparison to other secondary tools have increasing um, relevance for juries these days. Yes indeed there is a lot that's going on in contemporary times with regard to changes and as some people have noted a lot of the changes um, or the speed of change is tied to the advancements in technology that the advancements made have made it's easier for people to switch quickly, to innovate very quickly. And if um, fatwas or rulings are to be made to keep up with those times, some of these makosid oriented tools or the makosid sharia themselves, these higher aims and objectives, are much more useful because they have that umbrella quality. They have that quality that allows them to be applied very quickly to be applied across time and across um, place. For instance, this whole idea of um, genetically modified food, where in one instance you might have experts saying it's perfectly safe, but because of how quickly technology can help them carry out research, because of the pre increasing precision of technological tools, because of the way that data analysis can now be done very quickly, 
Within a short space of time, you hear that experts are saying, it's safe, but it's not as safe as. Therefore, a ruling that might have been based on the initial position of the experts would have to be changed. And if the idea is let's use the Marcosid, the Marcosid by its general nature, its universal nature, offers a foundation on which to pass these rulings. As we have said previously, repeatedly, that the Marcosid are not just ideas of um, scholars, ideas that jurists came up with. No, they are actually summarization of the position taken by several um, verses on a hadith of the Quran, which are then captured and, it, you know, they simply say this is the essence of all of these verses. This is the um, common denominator. When you look at all these verses on hadith, this is what you have. So while you may have verses on a hadith that are specific in nature, um, you know, applying to a specific context, if you look at what's common, then you find the universal kawaid. And that is what has made al Maqasid even more relevant today because that's the essence, the spirit of Islamic um, law, the revelation. Another quality in this um, VUCA world, as Brother Nasser summarized it, is that with the increasing ease of transportation, it's easier now for people to move from region to region, from country to country, continent to continent. So in the past, you had people living in a specific place, that's where their, um, their ancestors lived, that's where their children are living, and the jurists in that region can give a fatwa, a ruling, and the ruling would remain relevant to those people because generation after generation they are there. But you now have Muslims moving into places that for many scholars were initially considered alien to Islam, even considered outside Darul Islam, the, you know, the household of Islam. Where before, once uh, you would have Muslims saying the Western world versus the Muslim world. But with the increasing number of Muslims in the Western world, Muslims who have moved from traditionally Islamic lands there, they now have realities that are new and different. And that transition, that migration is not reducing. And then you have the Muslims born in those places because their parents migrated there. And they are not fully part of the system yet not fully part of the homeland so with these um these generations you call them a new tribe so to speak there have to be rulings that suit them so the specific context specific rulings from before have to then be put aside context has changed and with changing context comes um change in fatwa this is the reason why the study of al maqasidu sharia the higher aims the higher objectives of islamic um, law is important now and you have groups that are devoting their time to it such as the triple it that's the international institute of islamic thought um, the maqasid institute and also the dawa institute believing that this would really help this is not to say that al qawaid that is the maxims of islamic jurisprudence or usul al fiqh the science or the study of Islamic jurisprudence, that these are no longer relevant. They are, indeed they are, because Usul al-Fiqh helps scholars know how to rank and prioritize the evidence they are dealing with. al it gives them, gives them guidelines to keep to as they try to answer questions and solve problems. What um, al maqasid al-Sharia tends to do is bring balance add to the richness of a fatwa, give soundness once that triangulation is done. As we mentioned before and we said again, if a ruling is aligned with these three fields, then that ruling is most, most likely very sound and will endure and will be best at solving problems. I like that uh, point that once a position has been triangulated it is supported by usul, kawaid, makasid. It will endure at least as long Longer. as the context yes. uh, doesn't change. But mm -hmm. because of this VUCA environment, as you've uh, highlighted, um, mujtahids and fatwa councils need to be on their toes. Um, why? Because there is no more pause. There's just slow motion, non-stopping, going faster and faster 
and um, as you've also mentioned, all the tools are relevant, depends on the issue, but as we'll see contemporary issues coming up, some tools of usul are becoming more important, especially those that deal with uh, maqasid, some are becoming less important relative to others, uh, the kawaid becoming more important, the maqasid becoming more important. Malam Nasir, could you share some examples of this in contemporary context? So you will find a lot of examples of fatwas that are actually produced, where if you look at them from the perspective of maqasid, you would, see, you, would, you would discover that there are some sort of mistakes or errors that are, are associated to that. If you look at a good example, uh, uh, an example is the fatwa uh, that calls uh, non-Muslims or people of other faith, uh, I think it's a better uh, word in my opinion, uh, state, I mean better phrase to, to, to address them, people of other faith as kafir or kuffar. Um, and it is a term that uh, if you look at what the intention is and how they feel, uh, you can tell that um, the maqasid angle of it will find it faulty or problematic because it appears to some of them as insulting, um, although some might argue but that is the name they were called in the Quran and we've talked about this interpretation and the meanings of different wordings and therefore um, that has not really guaranteed the application of these wordings even if it might turn out being harmful. Uh, remember the Qaeda the, 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 uh, in our studies of Qawaid where a very important maxim who talks about elimination of any kind of harm that you should not afflict uh, or reciprocate or cause any harm to anybody uh, irrespective of his or her religion. Um, that, that, that implies that if there is a better name that they are more comfortable with. I think these are the kind of things that you should address them with not something that they find insulting. And it's also contradict the maqasid of uh, social cohesion, the maqasid of protecting and promoting human dignity and uh, honor, uh, which is part of the what we call the ruriyatul khamsa. Um, it is another, uh, uh, it's also contradict a very important maqasid of uh, building peace and you know peaceful coexistence uh, in a society. Another good example uh, that comes to mind, of course, is uh, the issue of insurgency, or what they call jihad al talab, uh, especially in a contemporary time where you find a group will just um, uh, initiate violence against some people in the name of jihad or in the name of uh, this or in the name of you know religion. Um, this, if you look at it, is also contradicting the magazine of protection and promotion of life. Um, it's contradicting uh, this maqasid of security and peaceful coexistence and, and social cohesion and social well-being of a society. Um, just imagine um, the situation of those in the IDP. Uh, the internally displaced exactly, people. Exactly, the internally, internally displaced people. In Nigeria. Um, in Nigeria, in, 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 yeah. in, 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 in Syria, look at what happened to Syria today. Look at what happened to some parts of Nigeria, particularly northeastern Nigeria. Uh, and many other places, how the life of people has become so cheap, how people are being killed, how people are being displaced, uh, people that, are, that, that, that were living uh, a comfortable, comfortable life because of some misunderstanding of certain fatwas or certain positions of religion. Um, people have created problems that really contradict this magazine of unity, magazine of social cohesion, magazine of social peaceful coexistence, uh, protection and promotion of life, protection of wealth, uh, and dignity of people. Another interesting example you would find is um, the fatwa, of course, uh, that some people, particularly the anti-vaccine, what we call anti-vaccine fatwa, uh, imagine in the era of COVID, uh, some people issue in fatwa about um, you shouldn't respect the rules or the protocols that say you should lock down. Uh, you, you don't have to go to congregational prayer. Um, uh, exposing people to serious danger, uh, contradicting the magazine of protecting life, protecting wealth. Uh, and you find some fatwas that are issued that are along this line. So the role that magazine does really is to try to 
demonstrate to you visibly the implication of that and how that is completely uh, contradicting the overall objective of Sharia. One last example uh, uh, that I can remember is this issue of beating somebody's wife or what we call domestic violence. Some people will be coming up with fatwas that uh, it's okay for you to contradicting the objective of this mawadda or rahma uh, in, in family life, protection of family or what they call hizbun nasab and erd. Uh, this issue of protecting dignity and honor, this issue of uh, you know negating the, the maqasid of marriage itself, where the Quran clearly talked about وَجَعَلَ بَيْنَكُمْ مَوَدَّةً وَرَحْمَةً This issue of love and tranquility and respect for one another. So there are many other fatwas you would find that are usually corrupted uh, without necessarily respecting the overall objective of Sharia. And what Maqasid does, especially in a time like ours, is trying to regulate, trying to filter this kind of uh, 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 fatwas and to demonstrate visibly uh, to whoever cares to understand and see uh, the effect and the problem associated with this, this kind of approach or ijtihad processes. This is very interesting because as you've alluded to, um, somebody would like to use a verse of the Quran to justify wadribuhunna, that you can beat your wife. When, however, you look at the maqasid of Sharia, um, you find the question of what does beat mean? Because if it could have multiple meanings, and for some of the classical scholars, they would take it whatever that verse is saying, even those scholars who take beating as actually meaning uh, a physically, you know, uh, hitting, um, they take it as darbangaira uh, mubarri, one that doesn't hurt. In fact, some of the Shafi scholars will say, غير muhif, it doesn't scare. It's not something that would tantamount to abuse. Uh, so what the knowledge of maqasid does is ensure that whatever interpretation it's going to be given, it doesn't conflict with the maqasid. You've mentioned the anti-vaccine arguments, and we find a lot of fake news being, you know, just peddled, uh, used and misused and shared by Muslims without stopping to look at how serious is this issue. And not just the maqasid of having concern for life and health, uh, especially the elderly and those who are prone, uh, but to even ask, who are we listening to? When we don't listen to our leaders, when we don't listen to the Ahl al-Dhikr, you know, suddenly people look at it as Muslim doctors will say, go and get vaccinated, and we still want to doubt uh, Muslim doctors as if, you know, uh, these are not the same people who said we should take the other vaccines that have saved uh, lives. Um, so really interesting how Maqasid plays a role in getting people to look again, you know, uh, to uh, have a second look, have a third look, as Awa'id also does when it comes to some of our existing fatwas. I guess as we become a society more sensitive about certain things than we were uh, before, we are more sensitive about interfaith relations, we're more sensitive about the rights of women, we're more sensitive about uh, cost-benefit, you know, uh, impact assessment. Uh, on certain issues. Sister Salah, what would you add regarding this subject of Maqasid Sharia, especially uh, when it comes to its the use of usul and kawaid? What Maqasid Sharia does is act as a, as a sort of a filter. If you look at usul al fiqh as the production of a ruling, and you look at um, al kawaid al fiqh, as the rules that should be followed while the production is going on. You look at maqasid as what you then would measure that ruling against because the ruling is meant to accomplish an aim. So the maqasid of sharia gives us specific things that we can say, okay, let's measure the ruling against us. The ruling meets this aim. So the maqasid of sharia um, serves to strengthen a ruling which is based on valid conclusions drawn for, by using the um, tools of usul as well as based on um, al-qawaidu fiqhiyah, that is the maxims. 
the relationship between these three is vital and it's very close. In fact, um, students who are learning them for the first time would sometimes mix them up, not because it's a confusing subject, but because of how closely linked they are. For example, we can speak of the Makor suite that we'll find in al Qurai when we talk about the uh, purposes that these maxims are trying or aiming to achieve. For example, if we talk about al yaqeen la yazulu bishak, this concern for certainty, for truth, for veracity, that before you make a conclusion, be sure in your mind of the authenticity of the evidence you are basing it on, on the strength of the evidence. Think carefully, think closely, be critical in your thinking. That particular maxim ties very closely with Ivdo um, Akal, this preservation and promotion of the intellect and of reason. Because there are things we could do to prevent the mind from being abused or from losing its strength, such as staying away from intoxicants and other substances that affect the mind. Then there are the things we do to enhance the mind, such as learning how to think and thinking carefully. That's one. If we take another um, of the maxims, for example, we take um, Urf, or what we call Al-Adam Hakama, that the customs of a people, or any custom in fact, can have the strength of law, especially when you say this is a good custom. We then look at the Makasid, and right there among the universal ones, we find that it said Hivdul um, Erd. Hivdul Erd. Mm. This preservation and promotion of dignity. Respecting people's custom is a way of promoting and preserving that sense of dignity they have in themselves. Now let's look at it, the, let's look at the reverse. The um, Kawaii of the Makosid, meaning the concerns um, that are meant to be preserved or the guidelines for preserving these things. If we take, for example, Hivdul Ahl, that is the preservation and promotion of family life, and we say what overarching principle can guide a father or a mother or a couple or even a child in their decision making to ensure that the family unit is preserved, it's improved, the relationships within them, within families. One principle that could help, one maxim, is Adwar or Yuzal. Meaning, whatever you're going to decide to do, be concerned about, will this cause harm or not? You want to prevent or reduce or remove totally if possible. Or the sister maxim, whatever decision you're going to take, if there is some necessary hardship or pain that will be involved, what can you do to make sure the person who is vulnerable in this situation, the person being wrongfully impacted or impacted in a hard way is helped. So the example you mentioned earlier of the interpretation of the verse Yadri Bohunna, um, strike them, beat them, beat them lightly, beat them without harm. However you interpret it, it sh the interpretation should align with Adwara Yuzal, al Taisir, so that the family, Ahal, is truly protected and enhanced. Another way of looking at the relationship between these three is when we look at the Makosid in Usul al Fiqh. That is, those um, higher aims and objectives in the tools of Usul, the tools of jurisprudence. Let's picture this. You've got among the tools of jurisprudence your secondary tools. So you have Quran at the top, Hadith Mutawatir, Ahad Hadith, then you have the secondary tools lined up. All of the secondary tools, which we say, yes, these are things that are part of juristic reasoning, intellectual exercise of um, scholars, mujtahid, their aim is to align with the objectives of Quran and Sunnah Mutawatir. And Sunnah Ahad, in short, the way of the Prophet and the word of Allah. So everything that you call the tools of Usul are all Makosid oriented, generally speaking. Then, as I mentioned earlier, you have the ones that seem to be more closely related to Uso, Istithab, Urf, and Istidlal, and the others. Lastly, I want to touch on the Uso in Makosid, meaning the um, 
prioritization, the ranking of certain things when you're talking about the Makosido Sharia, the higher aims and objectives. When you say, okay, this is the um, intent here, it's to preserve the family. The intent there is to preserve the intellect. The question would always be, what is the evidence for this? The evidence itself lies in Quran, Sunnah. So where you have, and the secondary tools, of course. So where you have a principle that is rooted in evidence coming from the Quran and Sunnah Mutawati, you give it a lot of respect. You give it a lot of consideration. It carries a lot of weight. When you go to the secondary tools and you say, okay, it's from the secondary tools that the um, evidence for this particular um, ruling that is based on Makosid is coming from, you still give it weight. So you have that same ranking and consideration. And actually you have um, the view among um, scholars that when you look at some of the evidence that backs up uh, the Makosid, you would actually say they come higher than some secondary tools. When you look at the evidence, when you trace it back, yes, the wording may be, um, the articulation may be intellectual, human-based, but the root actually gives them a lot of strength. So in this way, all three are closely linked. And I think what that does is to ensure the, the selection or the formulation of fatwa. Yes. Um, that fatwas are more values oriented. Yeah. Uh, either looking at past fatwas and contemporary realities and kawaid maqasid help in identifying those that are more in line with the maqasid and the values uh, relevant uh, to contemporary contexts, especially when we have evidence from the Quran and the Sunnah for some of these values or purposes. Um, the other question I want is for us to uh, look in the lives of the Sahaba. What are uh, what kind of evidence is there that the companions of the Prophet, peace be upon him, and may Allah be pleased with them, considered maqasid when it came to decision-making or the fatwas or the rulings they gave in their contexts? Okay. Some examples um, come from the Sira. A good number of them are linked to Umar ibn al-Khattab. One is when he included zakat and um, pulses in those things that zakat could be paid on. Even though from the clear words of the Prophet wasallam, horses were not included, but he did. And the reason was because at the time that he made this ruling that zakat should be paid on horses, horses were becoming more valuable. Um, Yusuf al um mentioning this and commenting on it, said something to the effect that it's, it's not conceivable that the legislator, that's referring to um, the source of um, zakat, intended that people who would earn um, the same as somebody else um, in a single day, what somebody else earns in one year or in years, should be relieved of liability. And he was using the specific example of zakat on um, um, animals raised by you know shepherds um, five or more uh, maybe sheep or something whereas you see a businessman because he's dealing in an item that is not in that cut in list would get away with it so to speak and he and you see that reasoning in the decision of umar radiallahu anhu another time when we see this makosid oriented approach in formulating a ruling Again, is when Umar radiallahu anhu, during a time of famine in Medina, then suspended the hard punishments as a cutting of hands for stealing. When he did that, he wasn't saying the ruling of um, the punishment for stealing has been abrogated. He wasn't saying it's not relevant. He was simply say, um, saying, looking at this situation right now, when people are fighting for survival, the conditions that support theft are in place. So until that time is passed, reduce the response. So it, it's this um, proportional approach to issues. 
Another time, um, a very interesting case was when after a particular period and there was um, spoils of war, which was actually in the form of land, land in Egypt, land in Iraq. And the companions, or some of them, expected that Umar would do what is the norm, which is distribute the spoils of war among the um, soldiers. And they wanted Umar to do that. And Umar and he did not. What he chose to do instead was to give only one-fifth and no more. The rest he put in the public treasury. Now, for some of the companions, why they came to stake this claim was because in the Quran, Allah says, spoils of war, let it be shed amongst them. But Umar then looked at a, what you see, a less specific verse of the Quran. Um, that's um, Surah Al-Hashr, chapter 20, 59, verse 7. And he looked at that ayah where Allah listed certain people who should receive from the spoils of war. And Allah then mentioned, gave a, what you call a, an objective, an aim, a fundamental one, saying that this is so that, so that this distribution that he was outlining was so that the wealth would not circulate among the rich. And if one looks at the various translations of that ayah, it still comes back to the same thing. And when we use our current day terminology, we would say what Allah was saying should not happen is this concentration of wealth promoting people from very rich to mega rich, where there's this wide gap. And once that wide gap is there, you've given a, a certain strata or stratum of society an edge, and that wealth just gets them more wealth, and the rest remain lower. So this concept of distribution. What Umar radiallahu anhu was doing here was looking at a verse that's, that, um, verses or a verse that is qat'i in thubut and dilala, meaning clear distribute, and saying, hold on. In this situation, Allah outlines a general purpose that will exist whether or not it's like this or like that. Lastly, there is the very famous um, hadith, the one most people just say, the Bani Khoreza one, and everybody knows what that means, where the Prophet wasalam, had sent a delegation to Bani Khoreza. And when they were going, he told them that they should pray Asr in Bar Bani Khoreza. On their way, the time for, Bani, for Asr was close to um, exp expiration, passing out. Some of the companions then said they would pray Asr before they reached Bani Khoreza. Some other companions said, no, we were told very explicitly, do not pray Asr until you get to Bani Khoreza. Others said, mm, but the Prophet ﷺ intended this, so it now boils down to how do you interpret the statement? So the, groups were, the group was split. Some prayed before they got to Bani Khoreza, others waited until they reached Bani Khoreza. When they returned to the Prophet ﷺ, they told him what happened. And he did not chastise either group. So some say that shows you that it's possible to consider the purpose in taking a decision and there will be no blame on you once that purpose is sound, once the purpose is clear. Thank you very much. We've seen a couple of examples here of the concern for consequences, the concern for the Makasid in fatwas. Malam Nasser, what would you add to this? Well, I think some of the other examples you would find uh, around the attitude or the activities of Sahaba as it relates to this particular maxim, uh, sorry, this particular uh, uh, subject of Maqasid is during the time of Uthman ibn Affan, uh, we have had a lot from the experiences of Umar in his time. Now, during the time of Uthman ibn Affan, where the standardization of the Quran actually took place, Uthman decided to ban the variant of the Quran that are uh, actually um, having different uh, what we call nusakh, uh, what, what, what scholars do call riwayat shadha, uh, so as to avoid confusion, uh, particularly as in relationship with the one that is standardized and agreed upon by Quran. What was certain, Mutawatir. Exactly, what yeah. was certain and Mutawatir. So um, here he's trying to uh, look at the maqasid, the maqasid of protecting the Quran and ensuring that 
that is shielded and the ummah is guided on what actually is the most important thing. Now, the second example is still during the time of Uthman ibn Affan, where he suggested or he added uh, the second azan during Jumu'at prayer. And the wisdom is, the purpose of azan is calling people to prayer. And now that the society has become so big, um, there is a need to have another second adhan, particularly for Jumu'ah uh, prayer. And that happens during the time of Uthman. So you can see that sense of, you know, use of maqasid in trying to come up with uh, fatwas or positions uh, that will help in, in easing or in guiding Muslims in discharging their responsibilities. Um, not only that, you find most scholars among companions using these tools of istidlal that we earlier discussed, the tool of maslaha, istihsan, saddu dhariya, in trying to address one problem or the other. And all of these tools, as earlier established, uh, represent or are trying to achieve the maqasid of sharia. In other words, you know, sometimes it's what you call a tool. Um, we call them safety nets when we were discussing usul. Uh, the things like maslaha, we had a lot of the same examples uh, used to justify maslaha, used to justify saddu zariya or preclusion, um, you know, maslaha as public interest, istihsan, touristic preference during the lives of the companions and the early caliphs and Muslims. Um, but when we look at it, these safety net uh, principles, as we, you know, to use that metaphor, are also maqasidic tools. They are also tools for realizing the spirit of Sharia to protect and ensure that any ruling that is going to end up creating harm, um, these tools are there to adjust and ensure that jurists have legitimate tools for realizing the maqasid. Um, for those who are interested in reading more about the subject of maqasid, for those who are interested in knowing more of the history of this subject. For those who are curious, um, who are the scholars, both past and present, that you would consider as some of the more major uh, contributors, writers uh, in this area, and what do they say? So let's start with uh, past scholars, you know, who are the most prominent in the subject of Maqasid, Sharia, um, the more well-known uh, ones and among contemporary ones too? Well, I think um, starting with some of the scholars that have really contributed in the articulation and the development of this very important subject uh, of Maqasid. In the past, uh, you would find uh, great scholars like uh, Imam al Haramain, Abu al Ma'ali, Abu al Ma'ali al Juwaini, uh, and his student, Imam al Ghazali, uh, having contributed a lot in the subject area. You will equally find uh, Sheikh al-Islam Ibn Taymiyyah, Ahmed ibn Abdul Halim Ibn Taymiyyah, uh, and his student Ibn al-Qayyim uh, also have contributed immensely in this particular field. Other scholars in the past that have contributed uh, immeasurably in this field are like Izzuddin Ibn Abdul Salam. Uh, he has really, really contributed immensely. And interestingly, some of the Maliki scholars, because if you look at Imam al juwaini Imam al-Ghazali, they are essentially Shafi'i scholars. Mm. If you look at Ibn Taymiyyah, if you look at his student, uh, Ibn al-Qayyim, they are humbly scholars. Uh, Izzuddin Ibn Abdul Salam is Hanafi scholar. And now if you look at the Maliki scholars, uh, you would find scholars like Imam al-Qarafi, like Imam uh, al-Shatibi, uh, have contributed immeasurably also in the development of this particular, particularly Shatibi. Uh, he has done quite a lot in, in the subject Imam area. Imam al -Makasid. Yeah, Exactly, exactly. Now, if you come back to the contemporary time, uh, in more recent times, um, scholars like uh, uh, the Tunisian scholar, uh, Tahir ibn Ashur, uh, has contributed immeasurably. Remember his discussion about uh, the intent of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He has done quite a lot in, in, in the subject area. Uh, Shah Waliullah al Dahlawi uh, has also contributed immeasurably in this field. Um, other scholars are uh, uh, Sheikh Yusuf al Qaradawi, uh, who is still alive, uh, Hafizahullah, 
uh, scholars like Sheikh Abdullah bin Bayya, uh, scholars like um, uh, Taha Jabir al Alwani, Rahimahullah, uh, have contributed immeasurably Ahmad Raisuni, uh, Jasir Auda, uh, Muhammad Hashim Kamali. These scholars have contributed, and some of them are still contributing uh, immensely in the subject area of Maqasid Sharia. Um, talking about statements, uh, regarding the value and the significance of this very important field. Uh, as I mentioned in another episode, one of the most important statements that is usually associated with scholars around this subject area is that statement by Ibn Qayyim, where he talked about uh, the foundation of Sharia is wisdom and guiding the well-being of people and their live, live, livelihood. It, in, in its entirety, he said, it's about justice, mercy, wisdom, and good. And therefore, he said, he argued that anything, anything that replaces justice with injustice, uh, mercy with its opposite or cruelty, um, good with mischief, and of course, wisdom with folly is not part of the Sharia, even if it is argued uh, using other allegorical interpretation or what they call ta'wil that claimed that is part of Sharia, he said it shouldn't be regarded, it shouldn't be considered as part of Sharia. And not just him, other scholars that have contributed or made similar statements uh, like um, Imam Shatibi. Imam Shatibi argued that it has already been established that the aim of Sharia or rules in Sharia are about human interests and human well-being and human welfare. And therefore, uh, it becomes pertinent that an act should be aligned with the essence and, of course, the appearance uh, of that particular uh, intent of human interest and human well-being. If that happens, that is okay. But it should always be remembered that when an act appear in consonance with the law or the rule or the rule, but then negate the essence uh, of that human interest and human well-being, it is considered invalid, it is considered futile, and it is considered an illegitimate exercise. This is very interesting. And um, uh, I liked, and as you've said, uh, Ibn, Qayyim, Ibn Qayyim's statement really keeps recurring in nearly every major book on uh, Maqasid Sharia, where uh, one, you know, somebody once described it as Ibn Qayyim's um, four values test. Uh, it was like a litmus test of whether something was Islamic or not. Uh, and as you've mentioned, Ibn uh, Bayya also quotes uh, him a lot, uh, where he says, as you've said, um, does it meet, you know, does it go in line with justice? mercy, wisdom, and good or benefit, you know, those four values. And again, as you've said, Ibn Qayyim saying, if it is contrary to any of those, if instead of justice, it's injustice, instead of mercy, it's its opposite or cruelty, instead of wisdom, it's folly, instead of benefit, it's harm, that such a ruling doesn't belong to Sharia, even if somebody claims it's according to some interpretation. And out of Allah's will, that type of statement comes from a person like Ibn Qayyim, who is considered the greatest student of uh, another great jurist, Ibn Taymiyyah, who unfortunately is sometimes very misrepresented uh, in, in certain circles. But uh, that his student will mention these, I think, is you know just gives a lot of weight to uh, the universality among scholars and schools of this. Um, Sister Salah, what would you add regarding statements of scholars on this? I think let's take um, a statement from Ali Zuddin Ibn Abdi Salam, where he said that when you study how the purpose of the law um, brings good and prevents harm, you realize that it is unlawful to overlook any common good or to support an act of mischief. Even if, in any situation, he said, and then he said, even if you have no specific evidence from the script, that is the text, consensus or analogy. He then also says that 
every action that misses its purpose is invalid. So his statement locks that the action and the purpose should be together. And that purpose should be, you know, rooted in these higher intents, these higher objectives, this what um, some would call the overall purpose of the Sharia, which is to bring benefit or to prevent mischief. Another um, scholar, Ibn Ashur, also is quoted to have said um, that the Sharia aims at preservation of the world order and regulation of the people's conduct in a way that protects against corruption and collapse. So here we see from his quote, he's looking now at this broad idea of human communities, human societies, that the actions of people from the point of view of the Sharia is meant to follow certain paths, meet certain aims, to help keep the society functioning so it does not collapse and so that it's not a corrupt society. He also mentioned that this um, thing of regulating people's conduct and preserving the qualities of society, like and, um, you know, freedom from corruption and um, that freedom from collapse or danger of collapse, he said it can, this can only be realized through the promotion of benefits and the prevention of harm. A very, because I keep looking at bring good, prevent harm. Very succinct, very simple. That whatever decision one is going to take. And even if we leave the purview of scholars and mujtahidun um, and uh, judges and so on, at an individual level, as a human being, as one person sitting alone, you don't have access maybe to all the books, you don't even know who is Ibn Ashur, who is this person, who is that person. I think once a human being has understood this basic basic idea that just ask yourself, is the, what, where's the benefit in this thing that's going on or you're about to do? Where's the harm? Weigh them against each other and always lean in favor of what's beneficial. Most of the time, the decision will end up being aligned with a verse of the Quran that you didn't even know about or a hadith, or a, a, a saying of a companion of the Prophet wasalam, or words of one of these excellent scholars. Sorry, I think even in common law, you would see statements from judges, from um, lawyers, from great jurists, that as I learn more and more about al maqasid al-Sharia, I keep saying, oh, that's what they were talking about too. So I, this is, it's common sense, alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. And I think you'll find um, this kind of sort of a guide uh, of what is harmful, what is beneficial as the basis, uh, just like she quoted Izzuddin ibn Abdul Salam, that uh, sometimes uh, if you look at what uh, the Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet, how they emphasize about this issue of benefit and harm uh, as an indicator, uh, it, now, it, now, it now demonstrates that on issues or situation where probably you cannot pinpoint specific verses of the Quran or hadith of the Prophet trying to tell you, okay, this is, uh, uh, this is halal or this is haram. Mm -hmm. This is a very good scale to measure uh, and you will find yourself being aligned. It just reminds me of this prophetic hadith where Prophet Sallallahu associate uh, goodness with comfort and ease in the mind and also associate uh, something that is wrong, something that is problematic uh, as an indicator with this sense of discomfort, sense of uh, trying to hide things and you don't guilt. want yeah. and guilt and what have you. He said, Al-birru husn al-hulq wal-ithmu mahaka fi nafsik wa karita an yattali alayka nas and you don't even want people to see. So this is enough to... Meaning? Yeah, you see, uh, he said goodness is this good character, good conduct, which uh, impliedly you can understand it being associated with comfort uh, and ease. And he said, well, if um, uh, sin. sin is uh, what you feel and ease in your mind, you feel disturbed, you feel no comfort. And, and he said, and you're even afraid for people to even see you doing it. So you would find a lot of examples like that where the Prophet or the Quran trying to give sort of you know, some, 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 some litmus, lit, litmus test, some skills that will, will guide somebody uh, such that um, 
sort of a framework yeah. actually mm -hmm. that guide how we, we run our life, how we relate with one another yes. and how we conduct ourselves. And I think um, there's a tool, I will call it a tool, used in um, the self-help circles that when you want to take a decision or take an action, that if you just visualize that you've already done the action one and you are going to narrate to someone oh, I did such and such, they usually say if even in your imagination you start feeling uncomfortable at the thoughts that you would have to go and narrate it to people, this is what I did, that that actually helps people pull back from certain actions and move forward towards some actions. You know, it's like the fitra. You are calling mm -hmm. the fitra to life. So even someone who... Um, at the moment they are thinking of the action, they don't see any wrong in it. They think, yeah, but everybody is doing it. They say, just sit down privately and just visualize that you've done it and you now want to go and tell people, what do you feel about that? I'm going to go and tell people, here's what I did. Mm -hmm. I know I've used it a few times and it's been helpful that okay. once I think, so how am I going to narrate this? Uh, okay, I have to look at this decision again. Maybe it's not the best, yeah. Alhamdulillah, I think um, it will be... Uh, it, it's definitely important to keep searching for knowledge uh, and we will inshallah have more time uh, on another occasion to deliberate uh, and discuss in more depth the various quotations that you have cited uh, of these scholars Ibn Qayyim, Imam al-Shatibi, Ibn Ashur al Ibn Abdul Salam. Uh, we will look at Al-Fasi, a couple of others uh, just so as to really understand um, the subject of Maqasid, its importance in the eyes of these distinguished uh, jurists, uh, but as you've already also alluded to, how um, Allah has put the compass of our conscience to be comfortable when it is a decision is in line with the Maqasid and to be uncomfortable when it is in line with the mafasid and um uh, and sometimes you know the the reward for good you know al ihsan you know sometimes the reward for good actually starts from the fact that your conscience is comfortable yeah. and that peace of conscience uh, gives peace of mind mm -hmm. and may allah continue to guide us and forgive Amen. us for our mistakes Amen. thank you very much for your contributions uh, until next time, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh.